I know I'm a different face than, uh, than normal doing announcements today, but we're one short uh, with our deacons today, so I'll be happy to do the announcements for us. Uh, before we begin anything and I get into announcements, would you join with me in a word of prayer today? Father, thank you so much for all that you do. And Father, we thank you for the grace and mercy you have given to us through our Lord Jesus Christ and, and the glory of, uh, of the gospel and the blood of Christ. And Father, how today we get to celebrate so much. And Lord, we're so thankful for all that you do. Thank you for this time today, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, um, the only recommendation I'm going to give everybody in the fear and admonition of the Lord, sit down and hang on. Uh, we have plenty to do today. We have a lot of things on the announcements today, and uh, many things are going to happen through our service, and it's a great day. It's a great day. Uh, if you would, look at your announcements. Uh, we're going to be taking communion here in just a little while uh, and uh, participating in the Lord's Supper and preparing for that. And also, we're going to be having a baby dedication uh, for Miss Evelyn Grace Woodard today. Uh, what a joy that's going to be and a fun time. And we're going to get to uh, just worship in that and be here together. Also, I just want to make folks aware that tomorrow night, Monday night, men and women's Bible study is still going on at 6.30. It's a great time to come out and fellowship together and to study the Word of God. Uh, and Wednesday night, uh, just to make you aware of that, we're going to be having a business meeting on Wednesday night uh, at 7 o'clock. And also Bible study will follow and a youth meeting uh, will be meeting that night as well. So youth come out for that. Uh, for a time of Bible study and business meeting. Uh, just to make you aware, we're still taking up for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering uh, to prepare for that, to give to the missionaries here in North America, and just collecting shoebox items for the year as we're looking for all those different items, um, different shoeboxes, uh, Ziploc bags, sandwich bags, and those that are there. And we're going to be continuing to take those up. But that's all the announcements we have on our bulletin today. Is there anything else that might need to be mentioned today? Ms. Kim? Yeah. Hey, Dan, we have a really severe buzz. Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay, uh, this May, it will be six years since we started the Lord's Closet. That's hard to believe. Uh, 2017. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about this ministry and how it's grown. Um, we started in one Sunday school room with a bunch of boxes piled everywhere. And now we have three rooms. Um, we have a garage where we're storing off season. Um, we didn't have a food ministry at the beginning, and now we're partners with Manna and we have and Baptist men, and we have monthly food boxes. Um, thank you, Cindy. <laughs> um, we're not just opening once a month, um, but it's a continuous ministry. Um, we have contacts with DSS, the school system, hospital, rest homes. Um, we have a lot of community partners. Um, so I was thinking about that this week, and if you were here Wednesday night, um, you got a blessing, or I did, at least. Um, we served 77 people Wednesday night. Um, we gave out 27 food boxes, served 49 meals, and gave out 26 bags for kids. So I just wanted to do a, a big shout out. All of you in this room have had a part in this ministry, uh, making cakes, picking up food, delivering food, cooking food, serving food, um, cleaning, donating um, clothes, sorting clothes, um, doing devotion, uh, organizing, praying, uh, taking off the trash. There's so many things, and I probably left off some. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of you in this room. Now, um, how can we continue to support this ministry? Um, I have some cards in the vestibule, and they have a bunch of names on them. And I'm asking this month, since we're celebrating six years, if you would take a card, and this is one of the people that came Wednesday night, and if you would commit to praying for that person for one month, for their salvation, for their health, for their family, all right? And then I also want you to think about how you can support this Lord's Closet ministry. Maybe um, you want to support it financially. Up to this point, the church has been uh, funding it completely, all right? And I'm, I'm anticipating that to continue. But maybe he's talking to you about donating something. 
Um, maybe donating some food that we don't normally get, like dairy, eggs, milk, meat. Um, maybe take that card, and if you want their phone number, I can give you their phone number. Maybe call them, check on them during the month. Maybe send them a card, um, but at least pray for them this week, this month. Um, I'm going to take a card that has Kim on it, and she's one of our regulars. And um, I meet her every month. And she says the same thing. I'm doing okay today, but yet I see her every month. I know she's hurting, and I know she needs the Lord just like we all do. So I'm going to pray for Kim. Our ultimate goal is not to meet physical needs, but to share Jesus. Um, I read a quote this week. When you're obedient to look after the the least of these, the vulnerable, the orphan, the widow, the poor, the Holy Spirit will come with the territory. So just be ready for him to do something great. That's all I have. Amen. Amen. It's a great time to be involved with the Lord's Closet. It's a great ministry uh, that we do here out of Oker Hill Baptist Church, and God has really blessed it in an opportunity. Um, if you've ever wanted an opportunity and say, well, I, I don't get around people that much, and I've, I've never shared the gospel, and I, I want to get around people, but I'm, I'm uncomfortable doing it in public, well, that's good. You can come to church on Lord's Calls at night, and you can sit in a room and get to share the gospel with people. Hey, the best thing is we close the door. They're not allowed out. You just get to share it with them, and you get to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them, and they're locked in there with you, and you're locked in there with them, and Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen. That's the good news of it. But anywho, is there any other announcements this morning? Yes. I'll make one. I, mean, I can tie it in with the Lord's closet. Kim talked about us starting the Lord's closet in 17. That was a vision that God gave Kim from a mission trip that we took. We were part of one of the ministries we did up in Kentucky there uh, to run that. That being said, for our mission trip this year, I'm going to give you the dates. We are not settled on where we're going yet. But if you are interested in going on a mission trip, we are going July 16th through the 21st this year. So uh, I will get a sign-up sheet out in the next week or so so that you can sign up and we can get our numbers. And as soon as we finalize where we're going to go to, we'll let you know about that as well. So just put that on your radar. Any further announcements? All right, we'll continue with the service. If you'll get your handbooks out, we're going to sing page 407. Page 407, Because He Lives. Yeah. 
page 411, <coughs> Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. We'll sing first, second, and last. Page 411, first, second, and last.
Did you know that electronics work better when you push the power button? I'm glad you all know that. Because sometimes I forget. Well, at this time, I'd ask if Mr. CJ, Miss Danielle, and of course the star of the show, Miss Evelyn, would make their way down this way for a little bit. I had to pick on CJ and Danielle. I love these folks. But I told them, I said, listen, I'm really glad she's here. <laughs> it's okay. Y'all tell me the same thing about my kids so I can just share the love. I know I'm adorable and I'm cute, but let me tell you something. There's nothing as sweet as a baby. Nothing is as sweet as a baby. If y'all would, if you want to take a seat for just a moment. Right now, we're going to prepare to get ready to do a baby dedication of Miss Evelyn Grace, and we're going to prepare to dedicate her to the Lord. Uh, but before we do, I just want to say a prayer over this family real quick, and then we're going to begin. Father, thank you so much for the blessing of the family. God, of a husband and wife and a child. God, what a blessing it is to be able to stand here with this family, this young family, as they are now preparing to live on the rest of their life as a family and a home. God, we ask you to be with them, be with CJ, be with Danielle, and be with Miss Evelyn as she grows. And God, that you would just charge us in our hearts and you would just convict us for the desire and the need of a tight, close, godly family. And God, we love you so much. And to you be the glory for everything you do. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Miss Danielle, would you hand Miss Evelyn to Mr. C.J.? If you guys would stand up here with me. It's amazing to think how small they used to be. It's amazing to think how sweet they are. This morning as we prepare to do a baby dedication and dedicate Miss Evelyn Grace to the Lord, there's one passage of Scripture that comes to my mind, and that's in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And it's in verses 26 through 28. And the Bible says, And she said, O oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. A baby dedication is not a baptism. It's not a salvation. It's a dedication. What this is is literally the act and the thought and the desire of God being in charge, of God taking control, of God being the one who now owns and operates fully in the life of a child. It's a dedication of saying, God, it is in your hands. God, this child is in your hold and in your gracious goodness. And there's nothing as precious as a baby. So this morning as we are gathered here to dedicate this sweet child... We, and what we are doing here is we are literally gathering together to say that we trust in God's power to uphold and use that which is His. A dedication is trusting God to take care of as Hannah did to Samuel in the beginning of 1 Samuel. Trusting God to take care of, to nurture, to lead, to guide, to uphold, to literally bring through in life. And a dedication is really just giving God the full control. And she trusted God with her child more than she trusted herself, more than she trusted anyone. A dedication is saying, God, I trust you to do what's best. And that is what a dedication is. So in an expression of love for God, these parents here today are coming down here vowing to God that He is worthy, that He is the one who makes the best decisions that He is the one who is now in charge of the rest of their child's life and trusting that God is the one who will not only be there to take care of, but to uphold, to be there in the guide. So right now, I want to charge these parents. I'm sorry, she's cute. <laughs> she's cute. She's a doll baby. I want to charge these parents right now before the Lord and before this church. Do you, C.J. and Danielle, make a promise before God alone that you shall trust God's decisions and choices above everyone else? Would you respond with, we will? We will. Do you promise to faithfully lead Miss Evelyn Grace in all truth according to the Bible and in a life that honors Jesus Christ? Would you respond with, we will? We will. 
Do you promise to faithfully pray over this child with diligence and perseverance for the glory of God in her life? Would you respond with, we will? Don't think you got out of this. Oh, Ochre Hill Baptist Church, do you make a promise to faithfully stand beside these parents as they take responsibility in raising this child for the glory of God? Would you respond with, we will? Do you promise to pray for this family, for this husband, for this wife, and for this child? as they grow in the Lord Jesus Christ and continue to fulfill a life that brings glory and honor to Him, would you respond with, we will? Do you promise to trust God in every step that comes after this regarding direction and choices that this family will make as a husband, as a wife, and as a child? Would you respond with, we will? Now normally... Many pastors come and they give gifts and they give a certificate of dedication or a Bible, but if you've probably realized I'm not normal. I'm not a normal guy because I'm going to give you something that won't go away. I'm not going to give you money. I'm not going to give you a card. I'm not going to give you a Bible. I'm going to give you my love, but I'm going to give you a prayer right now as we go. Being a father is not easy, and it's not a joke. Being a mother is not easy, and it's not a joke. There's one thing that lasts forever in this life. It's not wealth, it's not riches, it's not property, it's nothing but your children. That is the only thing that leaves you into this world that is a guaranteed to last forever. It's your children. So the greatest dedication you have, you're holding in your hands. So right now, if you would, allow me to pray over you guys as we prepare to go on. But Miss Evelyn, I'm sorry, I'm going to speed up. (laughs) Would you join with me in a word of prayer over this family? Father God, we thank you so much for the gift of a child. God, what a blessing it is to see a sweet baby girl and the dedication of her to you, to trust you for the rest of her life, to keep her in your hands. And Father, we ask you to be with this family. Lord, be with CJ, be with Danielle, and be with Evelyn as they go into this world. Father, that you would just keep your hands around them, that they would understand just how important it is of the family. Father, that C.J. would take his responsibility as a father serious. Father, that he would understand exactly what it is he is called now to be. Lord, that Danielle would understand the responsibility and duty of a mother. For those who rock the cradle rule the world. God, we ask you to be with her as she is preparing to mother and nurture this child. And C.J., lead her in the ways of the Lord. And Father, we ask you to be with Miss Evelyn Grace as she grows up, that she would be a light in the world and that this family would Walk after you in goodness and godliness and holiness. And Father, to you be the glory. And we love you, Lord, and thank you for the one thing that goes forever in our children. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. Everybody, Miss Evelyn Grace. There is nothing as sweet as a baby. That was an amen moment. You missed. There is nothing as sweet as a baby. There you go. I'll give you a second chance. I'm telling you what. It was a remarkable day when the Spirit of God took the Scriptures and really began to prick my heart with what I just gave CJ and Danielle in that What I have in life goes away. Rust takes everything. Moth eats everything. Dirt will eventually be on top of everything we have. But the one thing that goes from a family and lasts forever is our children. That's all we have. Our witness and our children. That's what goes into the world. That's why I take so serious the responsibility of husbands and wives to lead our families and raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord and to raise them up. It's so important. And now this morning as we're going to be looking, if you would, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this morning we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture in which the Apostle Paul is giving to the church at Corinth regarding the communion. And you know, it's sometimes it's 
the way God lays things out in that there's a schedule of many things to be done this morning. But when you look at it in the birth of a child and also in the death of our Savior, what you have is the gospel of God going into the world. The gospel of grace and mercy. And this morning we're going to prepare to take the Lord's Supper and Communion here in just a little while. And as we're going to be ready to take the communion and look at the Lord's Supper, and we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 11 as the Apostle Paul is addressing the church there. He is to remind them how communion is not a light nor a flimsy subject. You know, so often communion is almost tacked on to the end of services. I'll never forget the day when I was watching a, a sermon one day of a of, of uh, someone and they, they were speaking and at the end they said, now we have to do this because it's time and we're going to go ahead and take Lord's Supper as if it was just a haphazardly unimportant thing that you just have to do to check mark off the box. But you see, communion is one of the two ordinances we have to uphold in the New Testament church. Baptism and communion. We don't have sacraments. We have a perfect sacrifice in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to earn grace. I've got it in Jesus. And what we do now as New Testament believers, we uphold the ordinances of the communion meal and the Lord's Supper and baptism to affiliate with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus into a newness of life. And we take in the Lord's Supper an understanding and remembrance of the body that was beaten and the blood that was spilt. You see, communion is not something to blow off because when you do, it becomes very dangerous. And the Apostle Paul even shares that. If you've ever read 1 Corinthians, you'll realize that Paul is not afraid to step on a toe. He's not afraid to straighten out a crooked and bent people. He goes to them and it's one of his primary flaws that he addresses in the Corinthian church. He realizes that there's things going on and there's people coming to the Lord's Supper trying to get a meal rather than taking part realizing in the death and burial and resurrection and the blood that was spilt for us. There were those who were wanting to come and get more than a bite. They wanted the loaf. More than to come and just take part of the drink but rather they were coming to tie on a buzz. He was addressing a people who were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. He was addressing a people who were using the Lord's Supper as a gluttonous thing. And this morning as we see, Paul is sharing with us and he gives us a great assurance in 1 Corinthians 11 on just how to take communion. So this morning I want to preach on that subject, the how-tos in taking communion. So if you would, join with me in reading 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse number 27. And we'll go down into verse number 32. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse number 27. The Bible says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But... Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged... We are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned <coughs> with the world. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Father, thank you for your word. And we ask you to just bless the reading of your word and let every heart in this place leave with a revelation by the Spirit through your word into our lives. Father, we love and praise you and give you the glory and honor in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So this morning I want to preach on the subject, the how-tos in taking communion. And no, it's not about making sure you have the right amount of juice and the right amount of size of a cracker. And it's not about making sure that each thing is in absolute perfect size. Rather, it's about motive. 
There is how-tos in taking communion. Paul says there that it's, whoever takes of it in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But you see in verse number 28, he gives us one phrase, one sentence that I want to focus on today. I want to focus on verse number 28. As you see there in that passage of Scripture, Paul is sharing with them. He is commanding them. He is giving them encouragement and an understanding that though many are taking communion in an unworthy manner, you don't have to. You can take communion. You can take the Lord's Supper in a way that gives glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he does, and he shares with us the how-tos in taking communion. Church, everybody take a breath. I've only got two points. And I've only got two subpoints under each point. Now, I don't know how many subpoints to the subpoints are under those points, but I've only got two points. So you see, there's only two how to's in taking communion. And Paul shares it with us in verse number 28. He shares with us, first of all, but let a man examine himself. What's the first how to in taking communion? It's preparation. You must prepare to take communion. So how is it that Paul shares with us in verse 28 that we are to prepare? Well, he begins, first of all, that we must prepare with diligence. He says one word at the very beginning, but. But. Howard Hendricks, a longtime professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, wrote a really good book, Living by the Book, The Art and Science of Reading the Bible. I'm reading through it again. You know, if you're not a big reader, you need to learn to be a big reader. As the Christian faith, we have the Scriptures. We have understood understandings that we find from reading. You need to read. And there is a book, Living by the Book, by Howard Hendricks. A great book. Great book. I'm telling you, I've read it again. I'm reading through it again. And it's a wonderful book. But he makes mention of one thing that we need to pay attention to. He said, if I was to pick out one word that meant more than anything in the entire New Testament, it's the word but. Because it shows an emphasis of change. You know, one passage of Scripture we all quote. But many of us forget there's a but in it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only forgotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What happens without Christ? We perish. But it's a change of direction. It's a flip of the switch. It's a turning over of the page. It's a flipping over a new leaf. It's the change of direction and realizing what Paul was talking about, that diligence we are to prepare with because he says, but let a man examine himself. It's the diligence that we now have that there's an understanding there's an understanding of what was taking place prior in that they were taking of the Lord's Supper in a carnal way. You don't have to. You don't have to take the Lord's Supper in a carnal way because we can take it in a way that Paul says, but let a man examine himself. It's a turn of direction. They were taking it in a way, getting drunk at the festival, getting drunk at the festival, getting drunk at the Lord's Supper table and at the feast there in their love festival. It was they coming there to get uh, to glutton and eat and that they were doing so in such a way, but he said, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do it in a way that's carnal. You can do it in a way that brings glory and honor to the Lord and you can prepare to take communion with diligence. That's how we're supposed to, with an understanding of a turn of direction. But, but, but notice not only are we supposed to prepare with diligence, we are to prepare with devotion. Let a man examine. Let a man examine. You know, one of the most important things you do as a Christian in your life is daily devotion time. Spending time with God, meditating upon the Word. Now, you know, meditation in the rest of the world's religions is more about emptying your mind. But the Christian faith is more about filling your mind with the Word of God. Where meditation goes from emptying in the world's secularism 
to now understanding of filling our minds with that which is of God. And it's of devotion. We are to prepare with devotion. And that we spend the time. But Paul tells the church there, let a man examine. The word examine there literally means to test or to prove. Now, one of the strangest passages of Scripture you can find on the proving of the Christian faith is in the book of Exodus, or in, on the, in the faith in God. is in the book of Exodus when it says that God led them to the bitter mar- waters of Marah to prove them. Who got them at Marah? God did. Who sent them to the wilderness? God did. Why did God do it? To prove them, to test them to make sure their faith was strong and strengthened. You see, the word examine there is the same idea and the same word for testing and to prove, to show it is able to. And the real idea goes back to the term uh, and to the picture of a chemist or a metallurgy. You're going, preacher, what are you talking about? you got to put some fire under it to figure out what's real and what's not. You want to know what happens when the Christian faith gets a little heat put on it? It burns out all the chaff and the only things left is what's good. Amen, preacher. Easy believism, don't fly with this old boy. You see, he says, let a man examine. It's literally to put fire under a refiner's pot. That way as they throw in the silver, it would begin to melt and all the crud would settle to the top and you could skim it off and throw it away. It's like putting a a, a very bright light onto a diamond so you can see all the flaws. It's like putting a black backdrop on certain jewelry because then you can see all the flaws and the images in it. It's like sitting there and taking it and making sure that as you're examining it, you're getting the best of the best. It's devotion. It's preparing with devotion and putting fire under the pot to make sure that what's there is good to make sure what's there is worthy and true and honest. It's preparing with devotion. But notice what he says there. Let a man examine himself. I ain't got time to go through y'all's life. I got a long enough list to go through in mine. You need to go through your own. It's not my job to go around and band-aid all the boo-boos. It's not my job to go around and examine your life. It's yours before the Lord. He says it there. He says, let a man examine himself. It's the object of the verb. It's the singular focus of the heat. He is saying right there, let all your attention, all your testing, all your proving, all your examination, all the fire be put on one single point. Yourself. Don't raise your hand, but anybody in here ever pointed a finger at someone else and said it was their fault? It was their fault. They did it. You have no control of someone else. The only person you can examine is yourself. I've heard it for so long. Uh, The devil's up to his business. The devil can do nothing but accuse and lie, but he has no other ability than that. Devil can't make you pull the trigger. Devil can't make you pop the top on another bottle and get drunk. Devil can't make you get in a car drunk. The devil cannot make you do it. You choose to do it. Devil didn't make you sin. Devil didn't make Adam and Eve sin. He tempted them. But who did it? Adam and Eve did. You see an examination of ourself. That's what he's telling us to do. Let us examine ourself. Let him examine himself. To sit back and sit there under the full refining fire to put the heat all on himself and say, Lord, burn out all the impurities. Take it all out. Burn me to a crisp. Get rid of all of it that I could see and be tested and proved. I want nothing left but that which is holy. I need to be absolutely under the fire of refinement. I need to be purified so that I can see I'm taking communion in a worthy manner. 
I don't want to come to it in a carnal way. You know, one of the most carnal things we could ever do, and I'll be honest with you, is to come and say, Lord, I've sinned, forgive me, and then just take it without any thought or action. To paint with a broad brush over our sin. There's no victory in that. There's no victory in that. To go and just say, Ah, Lord, I did a bad thing today. I'm sorry, forgive me. And then just take it and just say, That's all I examined myself. I examined myself. I'm good. I examined. I admitted that I have a problem, and Lord, just take it over. That's not examination. Anybody ever had a tooth pulled? Anybody ever had a tooth cut out? Oh, dentist, I got some problems. Just bless my mouth and let's go on somewhere. No! They got to go in there and grab that sucker and pull it. Trust me, I had all four of my wisdom teeth done at one time. It wasn't a, oh, you've got bad teeth. Bless your soul. We're going to forgive you today and hope you're going on somewhere. No, they dug into my mouth, put me on something that made me loop your Looney Tune, and they cut my mouth open. They ripped my teeth out. That's examination of sin. Putting a light on the problem and saying, God, I need you to put the fire on it and rip that puppy out. I need it removed. I need the root of my sin removed. That's why we need a new nature. We must prepare to take the Lord's Supper. We must prepare. He says, let a man examine himself. How to number two. After we prepare, you must partake. And we must partake based upon our preparation. Does anybody in here have a New American Standard Bible? Anybody? Folks, it's a great translation. You should really read it. It's a really awesome translation. Anybody have an NASB? Fine then, I've got it for you. He says, and the Apostle Paul writes there, and he says, and in so doing... See what he says there, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. New American Center says, and in so doing, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Does anybody have an English Standard Version, ESV? Would you read just a little bit right there? You raised your hand. 28. What was right in the middle? Then... And so, let him take and eat. Then, and so. You see, it's important that when we take of communion and partake in the Lord's Supper, it is based upon the preparation that we have laid forward in our self-examination. And we're only able to take part once we examine ourselves. I want you to picture of making a cake, not baking it, and spreading the icing. That's disgusting. And it's a sloppy mess. It's getting the cart before the horse. You see, you can't just jump straight into the communion meal and not examine yourself. That's getting the cart before the horse. You can't ice a cake before you bake the cake. You can't put a screw into a hole until there's a hole there. You're not able to do that. There is order. You must prepare, then partake. And it must be based upon our preparation. He says, and so, and in so doing, then and so, only once we have looked ourselves over under the refining fire of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, then we can take communion. Then we can say, God, I'm coming to you with a pure motive. Oh, God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he's done. Thank you for all that he's done for me, that I can examine myself and I know that I'm standing here before you. I know that I'm here before you and I'm here for a worthy manner that I'm going to glorify Jesus Christ. It's partaking based upon our preparation. But notice what Paul says. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It's partaking knowing that you are preaching. 
You say, preacher, I'm not a preacher. Oh, yes, you are. Each one of us has a message, and it's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is it that we're preaching here? And he tells us, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. What's the message that we share? It's the bread and the cup. It's the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Then we can truly take part in communion, realizing that we're preaching the gospel of the bread. What is the bread? It's a symbol of the body of Christ that was beaten and it was bruised and it was busted and it was bloodied. Why? For me and for you. It's the message how He was a sacrifice for us. He took our place and was beaten and bruised, but yet by His stripes we are healed. It's the message of a sacrifice that He stood in place where I deserve to be, but He stood in place for me. But not only is it a picture of his body in the sacrifice, but of the cup and the blood. It's the cup of the new covenant. What is the new covenant? I'm glad you asked. Because the new covenant is not the old covenant. It's the better covenant. It's the true covenant. What's the old covenant? It's the law. It's death. The old covenant is Esau. The new covenant is Jacob. The old covenant is Ishmael. But the new covenant is Isaac. How in one you have the uh, dishonesty and the, and the law and the works and how you must work for God, but in the other you have the grace and choice of God. How in one you have God's unfavor, but in the other you have the grace and favor of God in the new covenant that we now have. I am bound, not by my work, but by God's sweet grace but also of the blood. It's not just the new covenant cup, but it's the new covenant blood. Without the, uh, without the spilling of blood, there is no remission of sins. Christ didn't just die, He bled. What does that mean? That He was the perfect Lamb who was slain without spot nor blemish. Why do you think we take such a wonderful time? Why do you think it's so serious we understand those little crackers? It's unleavened. It has no yeast, no sin, perfectly flawless, prepared before the foundations of the world as a perfect sacrifice who has no sin, who died for us. And His blood was spilt with no sin, no problem, no flaw as a sacrifice for us. That His blood is the blood of forgiveness and the blood of redemption. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. We must prepare and we must partake. So as we right now begin to prepare, and we know how to do that now, don't we? And we prepare to partake and remembering how that goes. Remember what it's all about. This is not just something we do. This is a bold acclamation and a bold preaching of saying, Jesus Christ is all I need. He is my sacrifice and He is worthy. And He died for me and because of His death, I have salvation. That's what communion is all about. So right now, we're going to take just a minute. Graysell, if you would. Where did Graysell go? Oh, right there. I was about to say, you're usually sitting back there. You moved. Graysell is going to play quietly for just a moment. It's time to prepare. We must examine ourselves. And don't paint with the broad brush. Don't just say, oh God, I've sinned today. Just forgive me and let's go on. He put fire on the point of it on himself. He said, God, shine the light in every dark corner that I have and burn it out. We're going to examine ourselves and then we're going to partake. So right now, just sit there and examine yourselves. Let the Holy Spirit just speak to your hearts. And if you need to come forward at the altar, you can come to the altar. You can get right with God. If you've never been saved, you need to be saved because one, you're going to hell and two, you can't take communion. I won't let you take communion in an unworthy way if I know you're not saved. You must be born again in order to take it because then it's in an unworthy manner. And you need to be saved. One, for your eternal home. Two, for a new life. And three, in order to participate in the glorious ability to share Jesus Christ. But get right with God today.
if you would come forward. Bible tells us in, in Matthew 26, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and dispersed it among them. And it says that they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the body that was broken and beaten for us. Lord, how Jesus Christ was our sacrifice. God, thank you for all that you do and be with us today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, Then he took the cup. And gave thanks and gave it to them.
says in Matthew 26, verse number 27, <clears throat> Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for the blessed assurance that we have in Jesus Christ, the new covenant of grace. Thank you, Father, so much. And it's in Jesus' perfect name. Amen. And it says there in verse number 30, it says, And when they had sung a hymn, they then went out to the Mount of Olives. So this time I'm going to ask if Grace would come forward, or you can lead from there. I'd, you'd probably be easier to come up here, but come up here and lead from up here, and we're going to sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet. Ask you to go with us this week. Lord, use us. 